Good afternoon, everybody. Um, delighted uh, to be with you and that you could join us for the inaugural launch of our very first program under Talk IQ, uh, which is meant to be a series of fireside chats with uh, the tra trailblazers and uh, outstanding professionals in technology, finance, and business. Um, our very first program, uh, it's, it's today, uh, and I have the privilege of being with Jennifer Fonstad, who is our uh, very first speaker for Talk IQ. Uh, my name is Robert Farrukhnia. I have the privilege of being a faculty at Columbia Business and Engineering School. I'm also the executive founding director of uh, Advanced Projects and Applied Research in FinTech. And this pro I'm bringing you this program in conjunction and with our collaboration with Bernstein Center. Uh, my thanks to all the amazing crew at Bernstein for helping me uh, bring this um, to reality. Um, now, our goal for Spring 22 is to have four different pro uh, programs with uh, four amazing venture capitalists and um, have a conversation not just around investment uh, horizon and opportunities uh, and, and so on, but also talk about uh, career uh, related matters uh, and kind of discuss the kind of mindsets and mental models and best processes one needs to learn and what we can uh, learn from our amazing speakers um, to kind of learn and adapt to the realities of today's world as being impacted by, by technology. And equally important, discuss matters related to additional biases that underrepresented minorities and women have to face um, in some of these uh, industries that are primarily or mostly male dominated. Um, so this, notwithstanding all these obstacles, uh, our speakers have had amazing success. So we hope to learn uh, valuable lessons from them. I should also mention that uh, part of a fun thing that we do for today is that um, I would love to have uh, questions from audience throughout. So feel free to submit this through the uh, Q&A uh, box uh, under Zoom webinar. And um, at the end of the uh, uh, fireside chat, we'll be announced the winner of the best question asked, who's going to get a free copy of the book that I asked Jennifer to recommend that she that I felt uh, she I asked her to share a book that she felt would be most uh, valuable to our audience. And this is a book uh, entitled Why Startups Fail, which is a recent book came out last March, which I hope again, you'll find uh, valuable. So certainly as you submit your questions, um, include your name. So without further ado, um, let us uh, dive right in. So uh, Jennifer, uh, it's, um, it's amazing professionals. Have had a long and illustrious career in financial services and venture capital, uh, having started as a consultant uh, at Bain and then uh, working at DFJ uh, for quite a long time, almost two decades, 17 years plus, and then eventually became an entrepreneur herself, launching uh, a co-founding Owl Capital, which is the early stage venture capital uh, out in Silicon Valley. And one of the benefits of doing this program over Zoom is that we can uh, finally bring more of these uh, speakers from Valley to, to, uh, to the East Coast. Um, so, and her, Al, Jennifer's accolades are, are too long for me to, to you know, read, certainly we included her bio, but she's been included on many lists of, of successful VCs and amazing moms and successful professionals. So um, without further ado, Jennifer, I'd like to thank you for uh, agreeing to be part of our uh, Talk IQ program and for the very, uh, being a catalyst for bringing this idea to reality as I've been working on this for quite some time. But certainly the conversation I had with you last year uh, jump-started it all. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna dive right in and ask the first question. Um, and that is from your perspective nowadays, especially given the fact that we have, we're, we have experiencing a 10 year bull run, um, we are beginning to see some you know, market gyrations and, and disruptions. And there's obviously questions I get a lot from my students thinking at where are we headed next? So from your perspective, what opportunities um, do you see at the moment and what kind of a challenges and roadblocks that are in your radar, given the fact that the venture capitalists you need to have a five, seven, 10 year uh, horizon uh, into your work? Great, well, first of all, thanks so much, Professor, um, for including me in this very inaugural and um, beginning, um, beginning um, of a, a series of amazing women. I have to say, I know all the women that'll be speaking next and they're all brilliant and have uh, different perspectives that I know the audience will really enjoy. So thank you for including me as the inaugural speaker. Um, 
I would say that there are several, there are several points I'd, I'd, I'd make in, in the sense that we've been very lucky to have a long run over the last uh, decade, as you pointed out, I've been investing now for 25 years. So I've invested through a number of cycles, many down cycles as well as up cycles. And I think there's a few characteristics that are really important. Um, number one is as an early stage investor, and I should mention that I invest typically when a company is just getting started, Series A is where uh, is my sweet spot. So anywhere from five to 15, 20 um, employees at the time. Um, it's really important to be focusing on what's the fundamental technology shift. So we don't spend a, a lot of time thinking about the macroeconomic conditions around what's going on in the broader economy, what's going on in the global world. It certainly matters a lot as companies scale and exit, but in terms of in, the decision to invest is much more around what, what is the fundamental technology shift and what is this business taking advantage of that technology shift in a new and novel way and how it's applied in their industry or their sector or their category. So, um, so for example, investing in a, uh, right now there's a, quite a lot of activity heard in um, AI and it's been a trend that's still very early days though there's been a lot of conversation about it. There's a lot of changes right now in the FinTech space is an area that you know well where we're focused on the DeFi market and really um, that, that notion that the FinTech world, which has been traditionally a hub and spoke system where all have to funnel through the, through the hub in order to get back out and, and there has been, uh, and there's a toll to be taken every time it goes through the hub. Now we're seeing a lot more opportunities um, uh, across the board to, to break that into peer-to-peer uh, -peer related um, transactions, both through um, crypto and tokenization um, as well as another, a number of other technologies of which um, I've been an investor in. Um, we're seeing a lot in, uh, in the health tech space and really a revolution around using genetics as data and using that data in new and novel ways to really uncover and, and discover how to, um, how to fight disease. And the pandemic's a great example of that with, um, with Moderna and, and some of those early applications for mRNA. So it, it really is about what are the fundamental technology trends and how are we really using that technology trend to really solve a unique a business problem in a unique and novel way. And a lot of the rest of the macroeconomic conditions are really noise that you have to kind of almost consider but almost shut out as you're making a decision because you're really thinking about what's this technology gonna really do for this business or this category, this problem over the next five to 10 years. Now, given your tenure in the venture capital world, uh, there aren't that many who actually went through the entire cycle of you know, the crash of the late 90s and you know, <laughs> 2008 and so on. How do you see, do you first and foremost believe that uh, you know, history, if not repeating at least rhymes, and how do you see the dynamics being similar and different, what you're experiencing now versus the big crash that we had in, uh, you know, in prior decades? Wow, that's almost like a crystal ball question. I'm not sure my crystal ball is quite as clear um, there, but I think there are there are some unique similarities in the sense that there's a significant amount of capital available. When I first joined the industry in the 90s, um, and I joined in 1997, I felt at the time that as though I, I was already on borrowed time in terms of the amount of capital that was coming in, how much had been invested in the internet at that point, everyone had been talking about the World Wide Web, blah, 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 how exciting that was to a point where uh, it was three to four years commercially um, where it had been, you know, there'd been a lot of investing before I joined. And then it went on for another three to four years, really three and a half years before we had had the crash in two, mid 2000. And a lot of the characteristics were similar in 2007 um, again, and it was really about the significant, you know, significant amount of capital that was available. Um, entrepreneurs felt like they just couldn't miss everything that they started would turn to gold. And there was sort of that feeling that, um, you know, the entrepreneurs, uh, you know, could make anything happen uh, and without failure. And the notion of failure is just as an example, the, when I joined DFJ, the fund that I joined we invested in 20 companies and only, and 19 of those 20 made money. And so for those of you who know a lot about venture capital, 
uh, the traditional early stage model is that if you invest in 20 companies, you'd have a third that would fail outright, a third that would uh, be a middle uh, level of success, and maybe a third that would make you know, anywhere from two to 10x plus money. So that was an extraordinary response for that particular fund. And it's not because we were all geniuses. It was because it was a time where you really, you were really taking advantage of the, of the fundamentally new and novel World Wide Web and applying that to a whole host of businesses. And you really couldn't go wrong. Um, and obviously that shifted fairly dramatically when mid 2000 hit. And we had a similar, but, but yet different type of crash in 2007, 2008. Um, and now we're in an era where we've been on a long, long cycle. Um, and you have a time where entrepreneurs really almost can't go wrong. And so when you think about what the similarities are, it's that you know, significant amount of capital, that sense that there's enough you know, technology trends that people are really taking advantage of where entrepreneurs can't go wrong. So that may be what I would say is what's similar. Um, What's different is I feel like there, perhaps even more now than there was even in early 2000, there's even more and broader based technology trends that, that entrepreneurs are taking advantage of. And for that reason, it, it cuts across a whole host of different categories, as I, I mentioned a few with FinTech and um, uh, genetics and, um, um, and AI, but there are a number of other sort of sub subcategories, certainly in, in clean, uh, clean energy, we're seeing a, a lot of um, really significant opportunities in that category as well, and, um, and a number of others. So I think the breadth of, of innovation has, has continued to um, accelerate, for lack of a better word, and that's, that's different. And so I think that's been a very key part of the uh, continued boom that we're seeing. And what gives me confidence that we're gonna at least continue to see pretty exciting companies emerge, regardless of what other macroeconomic conditions um, may occur. I do think a lot about inflation and what role that may play. I do think a little bit about some of the geopolitical issues such as um, obviously what's going on in Ukraine and if financial sanctions, are, if there is an invasion and the financial sanctions are imposed, what that might, imp what that might imply for um, capital availability. Um, so those conditions, those issues matter, but, but they don't necessarily undermine the, the fundamental technology shifts that we are taking advantage of today. You brought up a, a number of issues and I'd love to be able to see if we can codify them for students. Again, looking back at your career, what kind of um, you know, characteristics, skill sets or mindsets do you feel have served you well or that you've developed further to help you go, carry you through all these ups and downs? Um, you know, and also, you know, some other folks that you think they have done this successfully. And also, what, how about the opposite characteristics, mindset that were detrimental to one's uh, uh, career and success uh, in finance in general and venture capital in particular? Yeah, so, I mean, certainly for me, a couple of things have been critical for, my, for, for me. One is um, my willingness to take, to take risks and to take a leap. And, um, and I've been a, often a bit of a contrarian in that I've taken leaps in areas that may not have seemed um, popular at the time. Uh, and so I've made investments in categories which were not necessarily uh, areas that people were investing. So for example, in the late 90s, I invested in a company called Athena Health, which was uh, a health tech company. And uh, it was at a time where uh, it, health tech was being significantly avoided as a category. It was considered a backwater area. Um, and uh, and I, I felt that the, the fundamental opportunity around using the internet to enable uh, payments to happen much more quickly for doctors using that platform would, would really change the way people looked at health tech. Um, but it was a contrarian position at the time um, and took that leap and took that leap of faith. And, uh, and I do think that taking those kinds of risks are hard um, because you often will have, in my case, you know, my partners, uh, the industry, others that are, that, are, that are really naysayers, so categories. So you have to have a certain amount of confidence that there's an underlying data set and rationale for taking that risk. It's not just, a, it's not an uncalculated risk, but you have to think, you have to be willing to take 
uh, career level um, leaps, uh, risks that, 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 that may or may not pan out, but, but to do them thoughtfully. Um, another that I think's uh, been super critical in my career, and you alluded to this at the beginning of your first question, is, um, is really having an uh, inherent curiosity. Uh, and that curiosity is really what drives uh, how I think about uh, what questions I ask when I meet an entrepreneur, how I think about their opportunity. But more importantly, it's what really keeps me in the industry 25 years later, enabling me to look around the corner about what's coming along what technologies and how they could be applied and wanting to ask questions and learn about that, you know, you know that innate curiosity is critical to this business. The, the, the investors that, that last and engage and continue to have success are those that have a deep seated curiosity about technology, about solving business problems, about how it applies to people and, and communities and, you know, continues to want to have, they call it lifelong learning, but I think of it as more along the lines of lifelong curiosity. I, I fully agree. Obviously, as technology evolves on a day-to-day -day basis, no one can possibly hope to go to school and be able to bank an entire career based on what they learn in school. All we teach you now is just good enough to get your foot in the door and you continuously need, need to learn new skills, kind of update the repertoire of what you know. Uh, but Jennifer, let me uh, dig a bit deeper here because obviously curiosity is, uh, is easier to wrap one heads around and it's, you know, it's more, mostly comes from within. Whereas, you know, taking risk in general, whether it's, um, you know, for one's career or for, uh, you know, investment purposes, it's, it's a lot harder to codify. I mean, the old story that, you know, um, uh, you know, some of the veterans of Silicon Valley now had, you know, when they graduate school, they could have gone to many number of companies, uh, and yet they chose a small startup that ended up being uh, Google or Facebook. And obviously, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. But at the time, how do you make this decision? To what extent uh, can you ex exercise uh, kind of a codified method to qu quantify the risks you can, you feel like you can control? At some, at some, at some point, you just take a leap of faith and like, well, I think this is... Uh, I really believe in this, and this is where I want to bank my career. I also understanding that you know a lot of our students uh, are carrying debt load, and you know they need to be able to service the student debt, so that may preclude them from taking you know big risk. But where do you draw the line? What, what, in your opinion, is the right balance? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and it really does depend on the type of career you're choosing. Because in this era, certainly joining a startup in general, unless it's you know, literally you know three or four folks. Um, there's there is a significant opportunity to to both join those that, that company and, and not not have to risk your debt because you'll you'll still be compensated pretty decently these days uh, in most startups. So so it is it in that sense startup opportunities in your career are have mainstreamed a little bit um, in that it's not quite the same sacrifice as it may have been uh, several decades ago. But having said that. Um, I think at the end of the day, you have to have a real passion for the, the problem that the startup is solving and the category that it's in. And um, because your, an individual's passion will help, uh, help you make a choice, help you make choices and decisions that are more, perhaps more risk seeking because you care so much. So for example, if you, you know, you're very passionate about climate change as an example, and you worry as in your, uh, that your generation will really suffer um, from the, the risks of that. And that's something you're super passionate about, then your ability to take a risk for a particular startup and or in your career and or for that company in making decisions um, about who to partner with or who, you know, which early customers to go after, um, all of which are important decisions for a young company, um, those, will, those will be guided by your passion. Um, and I think that's, that is sort of fundamental to taking risk, a good risk. I, I was also speaking about it from an investment perspective, which um, is somewhat similar in that you still have to be passionate about the individuals or the category or the problem that's being solved. Because that really does enable you to, to, to take those leaps. The generalized adage is that students on the East Coast tend to be more conservative in the risk taking appetite versus those on the west coast as for someone who goes back and forth 
between the two, how much truth there is to it? And <laughs> if so, if there is something that you see, um, you know, how can we help our students overcome it? That's an interesting question. Well, I, I, I was born in Philadelphia and I was raised in Boston. So uh, one could argue that I would, was raised in a very conservative environment. Um, but I would say that for me, the biggest uh, risk that I, I took in my career was I took a year off after I graduated from college and uh, went and taught in Africa. And the exposure that that had, both in terms of you know, not jumping immediately into a career that where I was trying to you know, build my resume, um, but also just the experience of, of living and working in an environment that was so significantly different than anything I'd ever been exposed to, that it really helped change my perspective on um, you know how how to to make choices and how to and how to you know take advantage of opportunities. Um, it seems perhaps like a little bit of a uh, sort of an orthogonal move, but it it really did and probably did really inform and change the way I approached opportunities after that. Yeah, I certainly talked about and looking at your again career. We see a lot of points, data points that don't. You're going to seem totally outside of VC. I mean, you 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 study, uh, you know, uh, policy and and, and policies, and, and then you spend time in Africa, and then you become a consultant, and then you know, uh, jumping to uh, you know venture capital and eventually launching your own firm. So, um, you know, to what extent, uh, you know, do you want that nowadays? You know, it's a venture fund. Let's let's say hiring students, whether. Uh, out of an undergrad or engineer or out of MBA program, to what extent are they looking for a specialized, uh, you know, knowledge about VC in general, or to what or opposite of it? How much? How many of them are actually looking for, you know, what they call well-rounded individuals? Those who have, might have uh, certainly, you know, the skill sets, but they also have curiosity and interest in liberal arts or humanities and so on. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, one of the, the first associates that we brought on to Al Capital was a woman who, uh, you know, had a traditional background in some respects, um, had, uh, you know, uh, gone to Harvard and had studied in the sciences, but she was also uh, a DJ and loved uh, in her off hours, you know, it was very passionate about um, uh, mixing music and uh, uh, just that whole genre of of, of, um, of music and lifestyle that she was very passionate about. And it was really interesting to talk to her because she, she, you could see where her passions were, what she cared about and what her, you know, where, where she would, where, where you knew that she wasn't going to just, if you told her to go look at a particular category, she wasn't just gonna be looking at it. She was gonna be turning it over and examining it and really trying to understand, um, you know, the underlying drive, technology trends that were driving it. And that was really a key part of how we thought about and got excited about bringing her on board um, was really that understanding that she could, she could take the stones and turn it around and ask a lot of questions that you know, even we may not have thought about, about, like I said, uh, some of the early uh, healthcare trends that we were seeing in genetics, for example. Um, I see, so for us. That was an important part of how we thought about hiring. Um, you know, another piece that I think is really important, which is, uh, I think, an, an under underdeveloped skill is really listening and understanding different per people's perspectives, because oftentimes um, you pick up information by how well you listen. Um, people reveal a lot of information, not just by what they say, but what they don't say and how they say it. And so when we bring on an associate, they're doing a lot of due diligence for us. And so really being an effective um, manager of a process for deciding an investment is really about um, how well they listen to uh, the people they're speaking with um, in their diligence process. And so we're really focused on good listeners and that listening skill. <clears throat> and that comes up later in, as, as associates develop because you have to get to a place where you, um, your listening skills are evolved to where you're choosing when to listen and when not to listen and making an investment decision. Um, and one of the biggest mistakes and challenges that venture capitalists, I think, make is that they strive towards consensus and 
driving to the consensus means that you often end up investing in what's what I'd call the lowest common denominator investment rather than the one that's really the outlier that's really going to change change the world. We had an investment when I was at DFJ um, that we were considering in, in uh, the automobile sector and Tesla is, was one of our investments. It was a very controversial investment because only a minority of the partners and individuals really wanted to do the investment. And we had a voting structure that enabled us to, to have three out of seven be in, passionately in favor of the investment and, and prevail over the less passionate minor, majority. And that's a cr pretty critical capability because if you drive towards consensus all the time and you're always listening so carefully that you actually strive to, to do what everybody wants to do, then you often miss the, the, the gems and the opportunities um, that are falling uh, in between the cracks. So that when you're thinking about those skills, it's, it, listening kind of goes both ways, knowing when to absorb information and when to not let it become you know, noise in your decision process. Let me ask you one more question on, on kind of careers before I sh shift back to themes and shift in technology and, and you know uh, all those investment opportunities we talked about. So for students interested in venture capital, both on the undergraduate side as well as the MBA program, what do you think and from what you see, what do you think is the kind of a right path? Should they, there aren't that many opportunities for venture capital as associates to begin with. Um, so it's hard to break in uh, right off the bat, but nonetheless, what are the right uh, or better paths that you would recommend them taking that make them a good candidate um, when the right situation comes up that they would you can jump ship? Right. Well, I think you mentioned earlier that there are no right paths because of all of our strange backgrounds and how we found our way here. So um, I think that there is no right path. Um, although I do think, as like getting back to my earlier point, that that's innate curiosity and uh, you know your your capacity and interest in in managing chaos are kind of critical elements of it. But uh, there are any number of paths. I mean, <clears throat> some of the most traditional paths are that people often will join a startup and work in a startup, and I think that that actually is a great experience on its own because you you get to see. The challenges that young businesses face as they're as they're really you know getting started, and how do they find their first customers? How do they think about building out um, the product in a uh, in a way that is uh, there's real product market fit, which is often a fundamental challenge for any startup. Um, how do they build their own network of of individuals in the in the technology world or in the industry that they care a lot about? They may later be investing in um, those those skills and or the exposure, I think is pretty powerful and, and, and a great way to, to get started in this business. Now you, part of our capital and your work certainly is on early stage investing, which is a, which has a lot more art to it than late stage investing, where you have a company with you know, ongoing operations and, and data and financial information you can dig into to kind of understand the product market fit you alluded to. Um, so, and by definition, you also have to identify trends much earlier uh, because you're just early stage investor, right? So in your earlier remarks, you talked about, uh, given the fact FinTech is one of the domains you, you focus on, you know, you talked about, you know, uh, blockchain, crypto in general, uh, and DeFi in particular. Um, and then you talked about, uh, uh, you know, uh, energy and, and clean energy investments. Uh, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on each of these um, uh, to understand your, your viewpoints on them. So mm -hmm. on blockchain and crypto, first and foremost, do you see, do you feel like on aggregate, this is quite similar to what you saw in early mid nineties when web itself came to be? Um, or do you see this you know, playing out quite differently? Are we at the beginning of truly a massive shift in, in technology and you know, the way we built financial systems and many other use cases that Blake crypto uh, uh, and blockchain enables? Or do you see it continue to be uh, kind of chugging along before reaching the mass adoption um, and the scale that the web achieved? Well, it's a great question. Um, I don't see it as quite the same as uh, World Wide Web because I, I don't know that it's, I see the applications at least in the early days are not quite so broad. 
um, some of the applications are, are, are uh, can be brought over time, but I think it will take longer than the, the web platform did. The pl web platform was, was, didn't have uh, significant, significant headwinds from a regulatory perspective or a security perspective that I think you see, um, particularly with some cybersecurity and blockchain questions. Um, and uh, there's also some you know, issues around uh, energy use and mining that have kind of also moved people away from it, it being quite the, chance, the, quite the same opportunity to go as, as widespread as quickly. Um, having said that, I think there are huge categories with significant and broad applications that I think we're only beginning to understand and, and I think will be profound and may ultimately change the way we even think about uh, what does it mean to hold fiat? What does it mean to uh, be paid for our performance? Are we paid, is, is what, what more closely aligns our payment for performance? Is it actually being paid fiat or is it better actually being paid as some type of digital token based on whether what we what we do or choices that we make as a consumer, um, and really think those those types of opportunities, I think, will take longer to bear fruit, but are are worthy of um, considering how that how fundamentally this may change how we think about economics. Um, but right. having said having said that, you know the opportunities today from an investment perspective are um, still quite exciting and really interesting, even in their more narrowly scoped. Um, fashion and we're seeing early applications for blockchain chain, not just in the finance sector, frankly, but thinking about what are applications for smart contracts? What are cases? So I'll give you a good example. We have a company that we're an investor in that uses blockchain for managing um, information around the pharmaceutical industry. So uh, they're heavily regulated for compliance for tracking you know, where, what factory was this particular pill made um, in what quantity? And then when those are shipped, all the information that's associated with that has to be, has to be um, consolidated in an industry-wide database that uh, other pharmaceutical companies are worried that their competitors might see. They don't wanna see what happens in their supply chain. They don't want what, what they're seeing, what they have in their supply chain, they don't want their competitors to have visibility on. So they're actually using blockchain as the mechanism for tr transferring that information. Not what you would typically think of for blockchain because most people think of it as a FinTech application, but smart contracts and your ability to, to be able to share significant amount of information across competitors where necessary. And you can think of a gajillion applications for that. Um, I think we're gonna to continue to see uh, a lot of app use of app app blockchain, for example, for. Um, you're going to start to see, and you're already seeing significant up applications for digital tokens, um, NFTs in, in the gaming space. And you're going to start to see that uh, shift more broadly to, uh, to other areas that, again, take advantage of a digital community. Um, and that will continue to be much, will also be much broader over time. And you, s you see in the DeFi space, there's some early applications for how we transfer from transfer. Um, outside of that hub and spoke system, but it's still super early days. Um, and there's some headwinds there because of the regulatory environment that, that are still being defined and explored. Some countries are actually doing a better job of that than the US, for example. Um, and those may be earlier, early, earlier and better investment opportunities than even companies here in the US. Initially. Since you talked about all those, I'd be remiss if I don't include a question from the audience and that is, is there uh, an application um, uh, based on tokenization or blockchain that you have seen that you feel like it would truly revolutionize something, but in a domain that you few people talk about it? You don't mind, I've seen an interesting application for human rights and uh, you know, putting pictures taken in places of civil war or, or atrocities uh, such that should one day the perpetrators be brought to justice, there is a you know, immutable, um, right. in a way to, to track all those yeah. evidence. So I wondered, you know, one of our audience members wondering if something you have seen outside of finance that fits the bill uh, in, within that lens. That's a great question. Um, I've seen a lot of applications around uh, 
you know, obviously using cap using using tokens for managing uh, environment, you know, environments like countries where you can't, uh, you know, move capital out of the country very effectively, um, and or make transactions very effectively in a closed closed economy. Um, and those are some of the early applications that you know, I think are most interesting. But I haven't seen I haven't seen an application from a business perspective, other than you know what I talked about, sort of pharmaceutical and or sort of using DAOs in, in ways to um, overcome. Uh, I've seen I've seen a couple of cases where DAOs have been used to overcome uh, hierarchies and uh, and or uh, you know bypass sort of a, a billionaires or oligarchs. Um, hold on a particular category, but super early, uh, super early days on that. Now, certainly you deal with um, startups and founders and technologies that are quite at the leading edge. Um, and, and yet we are seeing this widening gap between what startups, the kind of technologies that the startups build and they can deploy. And under kind of a, looking at the broader economic sector, you look at a lot of uh, small and medium sized uh, medium sized businesses that are actually struggling just to keeping up, let alone you know innovating. So in right. general, this is an obvious question. Um, given your vantage point, what kind of technology um, technologies do you see that uh, SMBs need to uh, implement and uh, kind of overcome some of the initial hurdles that keeps them from uh, being as productive as they can be without having to spend, you know, ton of money on, on big licenses and, you know, software and so on. Is it, do you see it more as a, you know, more of an implementation problem or do you see more of an inertia or just, the, you know, not wanting to change? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I think some of the biggest challenges that, that small businesses have um, often is just being discovered. So discovery is a big category for how do you how do you hear about a small business? I mean, <laughs> in some ways, you know, the, the web enabled every business to become a, a global business in, in some capacities, but then there is this issue of discovery. And um, and so I think one of the biggest complaints that I've heard from small businesses is that uh, both Facebook and Google were exciting ways for them to be discovered. Uh, they really revolutionized the way that they can be discovered and, you know, with highly targeted advertising. But then as a result of that, they're now beholden to that, those two, those two platforms. And so many, many small businesses complain about how they can't break free of those two platforms in order to identify their customer groups. Um, and so I, th I actually think that there's, a, you know, some unique, getting back to our earlier question, I think there may be some unique ways of reaching people through, um, and, and it, again, it's super early, but the developing tools to enable them to um, access, uh, access their customer base and build loyalty more effectively so that they don't rely on those heavy platforms. And you are seeing a little bit of that now with, uh, uh, you know, getting back to our earlier comment about like NFTs and minting NFTs where like, uh, artists or musicians or content creators can, are developing platforms and, and to enable them to uh, access, let's just say, take Lana Del Rey, for example, she wants her fan base to be able to, she wants to cultivate her fan base outside of um, larger uh, uh, music labels and or platforms. And so she can, uh, she can build and use, um, tokens, for example, to uh, enable people to access information, access early releases to her music or, or releases of music that haven't been released to the public. Um, and she can, she can actually use a digital token and or NFTs to, to enable her fan base to have um, uh, a community that she, can't, she can cultivate on her own in a way that hasn't been accessible for, before. And that works for content creators now, but I think you're going to see other businesses as they build their niche be able to use some of these tools to help directly access their communities and build loyalty and, and relationships with their communities. All right, great. So let, let's switch gears, talk about uh, energy and, and, and climate tech. Obviously, uh, you know, the uh, premise of climate tech is that no 
no-brainer. And yet, from a business perspective, investment perspective, we have gone through you know at least one or two big boom and bust cycles, um, especially for clean tech that used to be hot, and then all of a sudden it became uh, kind of a hot potato that no one wanted to touch. And yet, this is an area of focus for you. So, what are some of the uh, high-value uh, growth niches as well as high potential areas in climate tech you see at the moment? Um, and do you feel like that eventual moment where you are going to flip and all of a sudden the floodgates will open is is near us or it's going to be still far away, uh, depending on how we can develop newer and better technologies. Yeah, you know it's 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 a fascinating area, and you know the, again the applications. I mean, if you talk to Elon Musk from you know te- he'll say Tesla is a software company, right? Because um, they're all about managing managing um, information on the grid and and how to use uh, how to use a technology to optimize when and how you charge your vehicle and how you uh, you know manage your energy usage. And uh, I think there's going to be continued to be more opportunities like that. We're an investor in a company called Ohm Connect, um, OHM, as in you know Ohm, um, and they they actually enable consumers to uh, sign up for Ohm Connect, and then uh, if there is a if there is a peak energy use in their community, meaning uh, let's just say. Uh, it's the 100 degrees in California and in a particular neighborhood. And so the only way that everybody starts turning on their air conditioning and the only way that the, ener- the PG&E, the energy company can meet that demand is to fire up a new, uh, uh, perhaps less efficient uh, plant. Perhaps it's, it's they, move, they have to fire up, their, they're primarily natural gas plants and they have to fire up a coal plant in order to meet that, ne- that next peak demand. Um, they can go to Ohm Connect and, and ask them to go to their community to reduce the amount of energy being used in that community during that period for that hour or two hours. And then Ohm Connect will reach out to that community and say, we're going to turn off your, we're going to stop you charging your vehicle for one hour, or we're going to turn off or turn down your, turn up your thermostat, uh, sorry, turn down your thermostat, which you've set. I'm saying this wrong. Say, turn up your thermostat. So you've set it at 70, and we're going to knock it up to 72 in this community for this period of time, and for an hour or two hours during this peak period, and that will over- reduce overall pressure on the grid. And then they take that extra energy and sell it onto the energy exchange, take the dollars that they've made from selling it onto the energy exchange, and they share that back with the consumer. So the consumer ends up with earning money for reducing their energy use for that hour or two. Um, They also obviously reduce, it's a peak period on their energy bill. So they're reducing their energy bill during that peak period. And they're preventing uh, the need for that energy company to fire up uh, a highly pollutant plant during that period as well. So it's this beautiful kind of win, win, win where the consumers benefit the business benefits and more and more and most importantly is that the environment benefits from that. And so there, and that's just a software application, right? In the home, taking advantage of, of the capacity, the connectivity between, um, you know, between devices at home today that we didn't have, you know, five, 10 years ago. So opportunities like that, where you're, you're, you're grabbing at low hanging fruit because you have connectivity in a way that you didn't have before, I think are some really unique ways that we can take advantage of, uh, re- you know, reductions um, and lower impact on the grid uh, it, that we wouldn't have been able to do without without all that connectivity. So there are going to be a whole host of other app- applications like that. Um, at DFJ, we were big investors in, as obviously uh, Tesla. It's across the board in terms of you know moving towards uh, more efficient biofuels and. Uh, getting back to my comment around uh, genetics and being able to use genetics uh, for health and discovering disease, you can also use it in using energy more efficient, more efficiently out of um, crops and agriculture, which then has applications for uh, biofuels. And so there's just a whole host of, of avenues that are what I'd call low hanging fruit that don't require uh, some of the massive infrastructure investments that you know, our government needs to make in order to make that happen. Based on what you said, I wanted to refer back to a question that was asked before. I had a comment. You talked about how Tesla views itself as a software company and 
Mark Andreessen famous quip that software is eating the world. So I would say that for small, medium-sized businesses, another thing uh, that should be top of mind, it's uh, managing data uh, and the ability to figure out, you know, to, how low code or no code ways, at least to automate uh, and to leverage the insights that come from uh, the data uh, that the company might be, might be collecting. Um, but this was an interesting energy company you, you referred to, Jennifer. So looking at the portfolio page of, of you know, our capital, you can kind of certainly see some of the, the, you know, some of the details and dig a bit more and understand, oh, that's a cool technology. But what it's unknown to us is, especially for early stage investors, the things you see in an, in an entrepreneur that walk into the door and make a pitch to the firm. So... Um, in, you know, within that way, and this is also another uh, audience question, you know, what's the number one thing or the top three things that you uh, see, look for an entrepreneur to walk into a meeting with you and, and your team um, that would probably increase the odds of, 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 of success or getting, you know, uh, investments from you in addition to the technology being sound at all? Well, I think that's an important comment in addition to the technology being sound, because I think that Product market fit is, I think, one of the most challenging pieces of any startup and really working. Um, and so we think a lot about, uh, you know, what what is it? What is the solution? What is the problem they're going after? And what's the solution? And how elegant is that solution for that problem? Um, so we care a lot because that often informs whether it's going to be easy or hard to really understand product market fit and how that's going to. Um, how that's going to scale. So you think a lot about how does product market fit work and then how does it scale? And it's very much driven off of the elegance of that, of that, how that, how that problem is being solved. Getting back to the Tesla example, for, um, which is a good, good story that people at least are aware of. Um, it really came down in that case with battery. Um, actually, when we invested, it was, uh, Elon was not involved with the company yet. Uh, so we invested prior to Elon joining the company, a strong technical team. Um, and what we really liked was the fact that, or what I really liked, I should say, because I was one of the minority that chose to invest in it, was um, I really liked the fact that they had taken, they'd really reduced their, their solution set to developing and using the battery more efficiently than anyone else had been able to do it. So it seems kind of, obvious now, but that the fact that they could, you, you know, reduce that down to taking, essentially pulling out the most energy, most efficiently out of that battery than anyone had been able to do with, um, you know, by, by stringing a series of, you know, lithium ion batteries together uh, was really, you know, a powerful innovation that enabled the business to scale super easily. And that, as you saw, was exactly what they did. Um, very elegant. We're an early investor in a company called Chime Bank, which you, you may have heard of in the fintech space. And that's 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 an interesting company because when they came in, um, they didn't quite have product market fit working perfectly, but they had a path for how they were going to do it. And they were able to um, articulate that path very clearly. And they were very credible entrepreneurs because they had worked in the fintech space before and had done something similar in a, in a prior business. And so you could take the data you had around what they had done so far, you could, you could see how they were solving that problem in a simple and elegant way that would scale. And then you had a group of entrepreneurs that really knew how to do that. Um, and it had a track record of showing how they could do that. And, uh, and th those are the pieces that, that enable you to take those sort of thoughtful leaps um, at the time. Uh, to, to uh, one comment and a follow-up question. Uh, I appreciate your stories about Tesla. It's fascinating. The more I talk to early uh, investors in Tesla, some of these you know fun anecdotes come about. And yes, indeed, contrary to common belief, uh, Elon Musk is not the founder of uh, Tesla <laughs> at all. Um, but you know, this focus of product market fit uh, certainly it's, you know uh, we all get it. But for a, especially for a first-time entrepreneur working on an early stage idea. Um, Sometimes it just you know comes about after a couple of pivots, perhaps. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, how would a first-time entrepreneur go about um, trying to to solve as much of the product market fit as possible that would make you comfortable that this is worth investing in, even though it might still be somewhat of experimentation at the moment? 
being an early stage company. Right. Well, I think um, obviously it's really about showing people using the product. And it's not just about people using the product, it's about people using the product where you, so typically when you think about total available market, um, every company comes into a pitch with the idea that we have a billion dollar plus total available market. Well, what does that look like and what does that mean? So typically it's not just, it's not a uniform set of consumers or, or businesses. Um, it's typically in that billion plus, it's highly segmented. There's this customer segment, there's uh, customer segment X has these product needs and product requirements. Customer segment Y has these different set of product requirements. Um, and so it's really helpful for them to have been able to demonstrate some fit with more than one customer segment so that you can see the capacity to scale and or understand how their product um, could satisfy needs across multiple segments because uh, no two customers are exactly alike, um, but they may have similar needs and you wanna understand how the product will satisfy that need across those segments. And I think that's probably one of the hardest things to demonstrate effectively, um, but is perhaps one of the most crucial, not just to demonstrate for financing, but frankly, to, to do to build a, an effective, strong business. Great, now in the remaining time we have, I would love to um, dig uh, into the you know, important topic of you know, being in industries that where one tends to find him or herself, mostly herself, uh, as a, in a kind of a minority position. Obviously, you know, venture capital has gone a long way looking at the number of women in venture capital uh, over the past, you know, 20 plus years. But we started at such a low base that still women uh, are, are, are a significant minority, um, uh, you know, in, in, this, in this space. So give us since you have been in this, you know, had this, such a long and illustrious uh, career in venture capital for such, you know, for, for over, you know, uh, two plus decades, tell us the evolution stories and share some of the lessons learned that you think it would be valuable. And again, I urge the, the attendees not just think about these in the context of women, because, you know, you could be, uh, you know, belonging to any kind of minority um, and still, you know, benefit from, from, from the lessons learned. Uh, so I have a you know, multi-part question, but let me stop. I'd love to hear your, 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 some of your war stories and, and um, lessons you could impart on the audience um, that would serve them well in their careers. Well, I think the most important thing that serves you well, and it certainly has served me well, um, and this may be a slightly controversial to say, but um, regardless of where you come from, and, and I, think of, of, I think of every human as having being in a minority in some way. And obviously, you know, gender is one and, uh, and ethnicity is another that we talk a lot about, but actually there's a lot of people that struggle um, and are in minorities in other ways. For example, introverts are, are, are a really important category that I think are not uh, attended to very well or talked about very much. And yet are often the ones that are quiet in a room um, who are saying, saying the least or uh, engaging the least in the group dialogue. Um, uh, there's massive differences between an age, uh, people that are older, people that are younger, and, and those, how those dynamics play out. So the number one thing I would say is uh, don't let your own inhibitions or gender or ethnicity keep you from doing what you think is the right thing in the room, whether that's speaking out on a topic that you you feel that you have knowledge and, um, and or an important uh, insight to add, don't let your own position keep you from engagement. And that's, that's just that truism, I think is, is sort of fundamental because if you, if you let other people's perceptions of you keep you from participating, then you can't shine and you can't make a difference and you can't have impact. So the most important thing is to not allow other perceptions to keep you from doing what you believe is the right thing to do in that moment uh, to really add value and to add insight. Um, the second piece I would say that's really critical is it's important for you to notice others in the room and to enable them to, to find their voice. Um, and that could be women noticing other women. That could be uh, a woman noticing an introvert. 
It could be a man noticing an introvert. It could be a man noticing an older woman that's afraid to speak or an older uh, woman of a different ethnicity that's afraid to speak, but notice other people in the room and enable them to share their voice and their perspective. Because if there's one lesson that I, I, I have learned, and this is my comment about the, you know, the minority often, it's important that the minority drive uh, outcomes sometimes, not just consensus, is that if you don't get the other person's perspective in the room, you may miss something super important. My favorite story about that is um, um, a friend of mine was uh, one of the leads on in developing the first uh, iPod and iPhone at, at Apple. So he was, a, he was the technical, the product lead at, at Apple um, at the time. And he'd assembled sort of a SWAT team to develop the iPod and then the follow-on product with the iPhone. And uh, it was an all-male team and a woman joined the team actually a little bit uh, later after the team had been formed and they had developed a prototype for the, the iPhone. And the team was really excited for this new team member to, to try out their new device. And uh, the woman grabbed the phone and was starting to fiddle with it and she had longer fingernails. And so she wasn't able to, to, to punch on the, on the phone and use it very effectively, it was sort of hit or miss. Uh, was it didn't have the right sensitivity on the screen the way the pixels had been arranged for uh, or the sensors had been arranged on the pixel wasn't able to pick it up because she had longer fingernails and so uh, the product didn't work very well and the team noticed that immediately and had to go back and revise the entire product now okay that's a simple example but imagine if they hadn't had a woman on the team and they tried to go to market with that uh, what a disaster that would have been and so you don't necessarily know where and how the insight will come to you or to the decision process, but it's really important to notice others and include them in that. So you don't miss something important. And certainly there's like countless uh, research and, and you know, both anecdotal empirical data that suggests and shows that, you know, being in a diverse group and diverse team uh, makes innovation not only better, but also more efficient and more productive. And the, and the, uh, the trick you shared, I think, uh, or at least the lesson you shared, I think would be a good trick that students could use in their own recruiting. That is most venture firms or startups are small teams. So if you go to an interview and you notice uh, one, some, one person dominating the conversation and not letting others speak, maybe that's a, <laughs> kind of a, at least a yellow flag, if not a red flag of caution uh, that you may not want to um, you know, be part of that company. Um, so as you're approaching the end of our um, you know, fireside chat, I have a, one, one, one or two uh, questions, but before uh, I want to also uh, announce the winner of what I felt was a great question I asked, which Jennifer, by, I didn't say anything, but you also identified it as a quote, great question. So uh, Caleb, if you could, uh, our team would reach out to you uh, with the prize of the book I mentioned, Why Startups Fail, uh, that Jennifer thought would be a good, great read for all the, uh, all the attendees. Um, but uh, uh, Jennifer, a couple of quick questions before uh, uh, we wrap up. In regard to, um, you know, uh, again, going back to career questions, do you feel it's uh, for anyone wanting to be in the startup space or venture space? Uh, there is, after pandemic, there is advantage to be in Silicon Valley or, they, you know, being in New York is, is, could be equally good or as good as, uh, as you know, other uh, countries or other cities in the world? Um. Well, I guess it really depends on what kind of opportunity the person is pursuing because Silicon Valley certainly has has a lot of opportunity if you're jumping into a want to jump into a large startup kind of what I'd call sort of more main a lot of the mainstream startups there's a tremendous amount of great companies and opportunities here but it's if you're interested in in genetics or you're interested in longevity or you're interested in clean energy or you know there's there's a whole host of other you know, regions of the world that are likely better. And even in the sort of mainstream tech, as you know, there are uh, they're opening large centers in all over the place now, you know, New York being one and Washington DC being another, but um, I'm not sure where the next um, hub's going to be, but I think there are, there are so many cities with opportunities today, even in, you know, Boulder is another one that a lot of folks go, Austin, Miami, um, they're going to find opportunity really wherever in any major urban environment in the U.S. these days, I think you're going to find significant companies and opportunities. So it's, it's best to settle where you will be 
happy and where your community is and where your networks are and um, and where and and focusing on the types of companies with, that you're passionate about and the rest will follow. Any final words of wisdom? Um, you know, I guess a couple things. One is, you know, I have my favorite animals that you should avoid, you know, avoid being a sheep, avoid being lemon, lemming, um, you know, focus on your own beliefs, uh, areas of passion, uh, because it is your career and it's your, you spend so much of your day uh, doing your career more so than anything else you do. Don't, don't take it because you think you're supposed to do it because you want to do it and you're excited by it every day. And if you aren't excited about it, by it every day, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, life is short, jump in, engage, don't be afraid. Well, on that high on that high note, Jennifer, I thank you again for your for your time and participation. Also, thank all the attendees uh, for being part of our inaugural launch. Um, don't miss our next event in two weeks' time, um, and you can find the details on our fintech initiative site, fintech.gsp.columbia.edu. With that, I also wanted to thank uh, the amazing team at Bernstein uh, Center for the fantastic logistical administrative support. And we look forward to seeing you all um, at our next event on February 17. Thanks again and wish you all a pleasant day.